Good morning and welcome to Online Worship with Central Baptist Church of Crandall, Texas. We're so glad that you've joined us today. If you're new, we hope you'll indicate that by just typing I'm new in the comment section below and someone will greet you and welcome you to our online community of faith. As we're wrapping up this year 2020, our church offices will be closed uh, this week. And so we hope you understand. Uh, if you uh, wish to submit your tithes and offerings for this year, of course, you can still uh, do that over the internet or mail it in or, or uh, someone will be glad to come by and pick it up. Uh, just let us know and we'll be crediting those uh, after the first of the year, uh, dating them December the 31st. So uh, not to worry about that. One thing we would like to tell you is that our Wednesday night services will resume on January the 6th, and we look forward to getting all of our programs uh, back in motion on January the 6th. So you may want to uh, share that good news with others. Now let's pause and dedicate this morning service to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you that you join with us even when we worship uh, on the internet. And Lord, we just pray that as we worship together online this morning, we will be able to worship together in spirit and in truth. We give thanks for all those who have joined us uh, by means of the internet, and we pray your blessing on them as they enjoy this worship service. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Good morning, Central Baptist and anyone else who's joining us today for worship. We're glad you're here. I trust you had a great holiday, and uh, now it's time to kind of get things back to normal, whatever that is these days in these crazy times that we live in. Let's sing together, though, this morning. Show me your ways, O oh Lord, that I may. tasted and seen the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my chains are undone oh your presence Lord Holy Spirit Your glory, God. 
God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hold. Your presence, Lord. Sing with me now. Holy Spirit, flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. Show me your ways, oh Lord, that I may walk with you. Show me your ways, oh Lord. I put my trust in you. touch of your hand stronger each day oh show me your way good morning I pray that you had a wonderful Christmas celebration uh, I thank God uh, for what He has done, what He is doing, and what He's going to do. As I said in the Christmas Eve service, uh, that's going to set the tone for hopefully the series that we're going into. And the theme for this year is ministering into the Lord. I get my theme, of course, from a passive scripture. In the book of Acts chapter 13, I know a few years ago, three years ago in June, three years ago in past June, uh, the Lord really got a hold of my heart. I love the Bible. I was reading through the back book of Acts, which is a, a history of the church. And uh, I, be, I was reading about the beginning of missions. And the Bible says there in Antioch, and by goodness, what a church Antioch was. It was a church of uh, uh, mixed nationalities. It was a church... Uh, filled with those who had and those who didn't have. It was a church that uh, had uh, people in every aspect of education, those highly educated and those who had little or no education at all, but they were all brothers and sisters in the Lord. And the Bible says the leaders of the church got together, Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. You'll read, uh, it began to listen, Paul and Silas had come from Jerusalem. Now they're in the church of Antioch, visiting. And the leadership of the church of Antioch, the Bible says, came together. And verse 2 says, As they ministered unto the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them. 
and they sent them away. Uh, the uh, church and missions was not begun in a uh, church business meeting. It was, it was born out of a church prayer meeting. Church on mission. And of course, that's the book of Acts. How the church went from Judaism to Jesus. And how it literally uh, turned the world upside down. And the world was changed, transformed, never to be the same ever again. And I want that. I, I want that. And I feel the burden of leadership. I pray that in these uh, next messages, as we set the tone to our theme of ministering unto the Lord, we'll begin to understand uh, how that is a priority. And when we are really ministering to the Lord, then how that God ministers to us, and then He uses us, anoints us, and sends us out. And I want to live for God's anointing on my life. I pray that's true in your life as well. If history doesn't teach us anything, uh, it will teach us this. It reveals to us that it does not take a vast amount of people to change the world. But it does take people who are fully committed to Him. And uh, we'll never, we'll never uh, be used of God the way we could be used if we're not fully committed to Him. Uh, we're, we're hearing many voices in our culture today that uh, is calling for cultural revolution. And we are paralyzed by scandals and injustice. We need, uh, we need change, and the political uh, arena is not the place that we're going to look for our transformation of our country and change in our people. Uh, you cannot regulate, you cannot legislate people to do right. And I want to tell you, my friend, when uh, people really understand who God is and commits their life to Him, things begin to change. And so I want to talk about to that today. Uh, ministering to the Lord, it all begins with our commitment to God. Weak people are controlled by their circumstances, but strong people are dominated by their commitments in life. Uh, our commitments define our life. Tell me what you're committed to, and uh, certainly I, I can give you an idea about where your life is, is headed, what's important to you. The Bible says that God is looking for people. You know, in our uh, last few months, we've been uh, looking at the scripture out of the Old Testament where God says that uh, the eye of the Lord is searching the whole earth in order to uh, strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. I want to tell you, my friend, uh, God is looking for people whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Our 2020 vision has been we're going to hold nothing back in terms of being fully devoted to our blessed Lord because God has a plan and a purpose for our life. But just because God has a plan and purpose for your life doesn't mean, A, that you're willing to do it, or B, you even understand what it is. Uh, the carnal mind can't comprehend spiritual things. But my friend, when you commit your life to Christ and you're living a fully committed life to Him, the Bible says that He'll reveal your, His plan and His purpose to your life, that God will anoint you with His Holy Spirit. And just like Paul and Silas, you can go out and uh, be great for God and impact the world for God. I want to impact this world for God. I, I want our church to be impactful for God. I want you to impact your world for God. And God has a plan and a purpose for every church as well. But would you agree with me that it's, it seems obvious in, in our world that every church is not seeking to know or fulfill God's plan for their life? Well, I am, as your pastor, I'm saying I want us to uh, be directed and controlled by the Holy Spirit so that we're fulfilling God's plan and God's purpose for our church. In order to be all that God wants you to be, uh, you must be, I must be, our church must be fully committed to the Lord, fully commit my life to Him. Uh, if I'm fully committed, I will become all God has meant for me to be. If I uh, commit only some uh, of, of uh, my life to the purposes of God in my life, then my life's going to be limited. But if I, if, if I uh, uh, want God uh, to impact the world through me, then that means I'm willing to commit my life to Him so that He might work in my life. So today, in kind of this beginning message in this series that we're going to be looking at, uh, what, is it, what does it mean to be fully committed to God? What, uh, what, must, what does that look like? 
Uh, what is it to be committed to the Lord? Well, I want to suggest five things today in the message as we begin thinking about it, because it all begins with our commitment to the Lord. Uh, number one, to be all God wants me to be, I must be committed. Uh, I must commit my life to Jesus Christ. Some of the greatest questions in life are the career question, the covenant question, and the creator question. The career question is, uh, what am I going to uh, live on? Uh, and that's, that's on everybody's mind, especially as you're beginning out your life. Uh, what am I going to do in life How, so in order I can make money and uh, have, have sustained myself in life? Uh, that's, that's what's known as the career question. What am I going to live on? The covenant question is, who am I going to live with? And I think in our life, early on in life, we start wondering about uh, who, are, who are we going to live our life with? Who, who are we going to marry? Who's going to be our husband? Who's going to be our wife? Who's going to be our children? And what's our family going to look like? It has to do with who am I going to live my life with? Now, I want to tell you about these commitments. Uh, you can get those two questions wrong. And uh, while it might bring pain and discomfort to your life, it doesn't have eternal consequences. But if you miss this third question, the, career, the creator question, it's going to affect not just your life here and now, but your life in and out, in out through eternity. And here it is. Who am I going to live my life for? And that's a great question that people grapple with in their life. And I'm sure many hearing me right now would say, well, Pastor, that, that's true. Uh, I am grappling with who am I going to live my life for. There are so many ideas out there. There's so many uh, concepts out there. I was talking to a young man just this week that uh, is confused. There's so many, you know, you can go on uh, the internet and find uh, all kinds of questions and ideas about uh, why we're here, how we got here, where we're going, what, what is our life supposed to be about. But I want to tell you the Bible is the authority of the Word of God. Uh, it is God who spoke this world into existence. It is God who spoke this word to us uh, so that we might understand what God's plan and purpose for our life is. Who are you going to be committed to? That's the main question in life. Everyone is going to live for someone or for something. We live for the approval of parents or for our spouses, our bosses, or uh, even ourselves. Uh, are you going to live for your creator, or are you going to be living for culture? And just look around in our world today, and you'll see that so many people are, are living their life dominated by the opinion of other people, their peers, their, the culture that we live in. Uh, but as I, I said, in the church at Antioch, uh, they ministered in the Lord where they were committing to please God with all their life, the only thing that they were interested in. And we could go back and read who is part of that. Uh, of course, Saul and Barnabas was there. We know the impact they had in the world. Uh, uh, Simon, who was called Niger. Uh, many people believe that, that this Simon was the same Simon who uh, was selected by the Romans to carry the cross. Luke chapter 23. Uh, up to Calvary's uh, place of crucifixion. Evidently, uh, he, he found Christ, that Christ was not just someone who carried the cross literally far, but uh, he received him as Messiah. His life was impacted. And, and now we find him as a pastor uh, in, in the church at Antioch. Our uh, Menai, who the Bible says was, uh, uh, grew up with Herod the Tetrarch, here this evil man as his father was evil, who was uh, in rule. Uh, when Jesus Christ was put on trial and did nothing to uh, stop the crucifixion, uh, made light of who Christ was, just like so many of us do. And yet, uh, God got a hold of somebody right there and in, in, in grew up with him and got a hold of his heart and he committed himself to God. Now, Herod is coming on, but I'm telling you, the impact of Maniah is still felt in this world today. Listen, my friend, uh, because of the commitment that he made, shaped and changed the destination of his entire life uh, because uh, of the church at Antioch. He said, I want to minister unto the Lord. I, I want God to bring a smile to your face. 
God, you're important to us. We love you because you're God. And we want, we want to be used by you to make an impact in the world. You're our Father. You're our Heavenly Father. And we want to be a blessing. We want to, we want to make an impact in this world. What does it mean to commit your life to Christ? Well, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, a very familiar passage of Scripture, the Bible says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. I think it's interesting that God made it so simple that, that even a child could understand what it is to commit their life to Christ. That word Lord is a, uh, is a, a word that simply means manager or controller or director of your life. God wants to direct our lives. Why? Because He loves us. He, he loves you. Listen, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't come into the world, verse 17 says, to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Listen, Christ came. He wants to direct our life because He wants to save us, not certainly eternally, save us by being born in the family of God, save us from the wrath of sin and the consequences of sin. But, but to save us, uh, from uh, wasting our life, not using it to the fullest. He wants to direct our life. Uh, he has a plan for our life. He wants to manage our life and the direction of our life. He wants to influence your choice. He wants to influence my choice because life is just a matter of choices. And the choices that we make are affecting drastically our life, but He's also affecting our entire world. Every commitment that you make has a cost and it has a benefit. Are you going to uh, uh, have to ask the question, uh, is the benefit worth the cost? Because every choice has a cost. Every commitment has a cost and has a benefit. The cost of putting God's will uh, before our will. Uh, as they said in, in Acts chapter 13, they set apart... For the work of God. Uh, they said God's plan and purpose is the most important thing. We're going to commit to that. The cost of, uh, of, of uh, committing yourself to Christ. Is the cost of putting God's will before your will and my will. And I know that's a struggle. But listen to me. I, I, I'm, I'm older in my life. I've been in ministry for over 50 years. And I want to tell you my friend. Uh, every day is a decision in my life. God. Am I going to choose your will or my will? It's a constant uh, choice that I have to make in my commitment to live for God. It's a cause of opposition. If you read through Acts chapter 13, I hope that you will do that. You'll discover that, that soon uh, there was op opposition. There are people that were going to be opposed even to their, their commitment to live out God's plan and purpose. And you're going to be opposed. It's not going to be easy. If somebody tells you, uh, that uh, it's easy to live the Christian life. You just need to know that the Bible says it's not easy. Uh, all who live godly, the Bible says, is going to suffer persecution. There's going to be opposition to our life. And another cost is, is that people uh, want to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, but others will want to stop you from even proclaiming the gospel of Christ. I was talking to one of our members this week, and he was saying, you know, Pastor, all my life it seems as if there's been satanic opposition to my life. But I want to tell you, my friend, uh, the person that's trying to commit their life to Christ is going to draw the attention of Satan. And uh, he's going to come against you. Every time you make and keep a commitment, however, your life is going to grow in character and it's grow, going to grow in maturity. It costs to be... Committed to Jesus Christ. Uh, giving up control of your life. No longer am I going to live my plan, but I'm going to live God's plan. That's the commitment. Jesus said to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these other things will be added unto you. That's a promise of God. You see, that's the positive benefit of committing your life to Christ. If, if I, I'm living my life committed to Christ, it takes away so much anxiety, so much worry, so much fear, because I have the promise of God. If I just do that, if I make God the priority of my life, the Bible says clearly that He's going to meet the needs of my life. What a, what a, what a promise from the Word of God. 
The psalmist David uh, said that he's never seen the righteous forsaken nor see the seed of the righteous begging for bread. What he was saying is that God is faithful to keep his promise to us. Uh, we should say, God, I want to live out your plan for my life in this life. I want to be who you want me to be. I want to be where you want me to be. Why? Because I know that that is the greatest benefit of my life will be derived because of my relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. What is those benefits? Well, uh, we talked about that last week. I, I said, Rick Warren, I think, has summed it up better than anyone I've ever seen. Heard uh, your past forgiven, a purpose for living, and a home in heaven. Uh, our, our sins are forgiven. Guilt is gone. I don't have to live uh, waiting for the hammer of God's judgment to fall on my life. I want to tell you, my friend, uh, I live in freedom. I live because I know that I've been forgiven of my sin. And I am going to be in heaven. I, if the worst thing that happens to me in this life is death, I know that it's not the end. It's really just the beginning for me. Uh, I get a purpose for living. I get significance in my life. I'm telling you, I find joy in knowing that, that uh, my life has an opportunity of making a genuine difference in the life of other people. And uh, I tell you, just over these last few weeks, uh, testimony after testimony has come to me from people saying, Brother Charlie, because of your commitment, my life is different. God used you and helped change my life. I want to tell you, how could you find more joy than that anywhere in the world? And you get a home in heaven. I have hope. I have hope, man. I, I, I'm not living a hopeless life. I'm not wringing my hands uh, because of who's in the political office or uh, what the culture is saying or not saying or doing or not doing. I'm telling you, man, I have hope because I've been redeemed and I'm going to be in the presence of God forever. Uh, to commit all, all, be everything God wants me to be, I must, second of all, commit to be a member of His family. You see, God has called me and be born again, uh, but, but being born again means that uh, we need to be connected to a family. When I was born so many years ago, I wasn't born just one of six billion I was born one of six children, and it was in my home, a mom and a dad who took me from the hospital uh, into their home, and their sibling, my siblings, and, and it was in that environment that I grew and matured and uh, developed and learned and uh, found joy and found relationships and found family. I want to tell you in that same way, uh, many people believe the idea is, well, if, I, if I'm just born again, that's, that's the end of it. Well, it is, and it's really the beginning of it. Uh, because God wants us to be a part of His family. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 3, the Bible says this, God has given us the privilege to be born again so that we are now members of His own family. God has called us to be a part of His family. Being a member uh, of certain things has its own privileges. American Express uh, used to have their, their byline, used to be, uh, being a member has its privilege. Well, that's right. Being a member of uh, certain things brings certain privileges with it. A privilege of knowing Christ means that I have the perfect Heavenly Father who is more committed to us than we are willing to be committed to Him. I want to tell you, the Bible says, even when we are faithless, God remains faithful. I'm going to tell you, that's commitment from Him. He loves us. Jeremiah 31, a verse I, I, I repeat often, especially in my prayer time. Uh, I am loved with an everlasting love, and in loving kindness, He's drawing me close to Him. I want to tell you, God loves me, and I matter. And He makes me feel that way all the time in my life. And I pray that's true in your life. But if it isn't, it may be uh, not just because you haven't been born again, but because you're not part of a family of God. I think that's one of the horrible things of the pandemic is certainly people being ill and dying. I mean, that's horrible enough and it's of itself. But one of the devastations of it has been uh, people not unable to attend church and be with their brothers and sisters. It's one thing for you to watch it over the uh, television today. It's another thing for you to be in fellowship and in harmony as you worship together and live in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in the Lord. God has called us to be a part of His church family. 
Uh, you know, we have brothers and sisters all over the world. And every day in my life, in my prayer time, uh, I'm all over the world as I pray for people. Man, I'm there with them uh, because I'm praying for them. They're my brothers and sisters. It's so wonderful to be on a mission trip and you meet Christians in Brazil and Argentina and Mexico and, and you discover that they are your brothers and sisters. We go, Why? We're, we're part of the same family. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, Paul encourages us, be devoted one to another. What does it mean to us? Well, it allows us to move from being a spectator and to being a, a participator. I love college football. And I'm a great spectator. But I can't imagine if I had the skills and ability of what it would be like to be playing in one of these bowl games, uh, maybe in a championship game, and not just be a spectator in the stands, but be a participant on the field. Do you think that would be a, a, a little bit of a different rush, uh, being on the field and being able to be a part of that? Uh, being in the, uh, a Christian family uh, moves me uh, from just believing to belonging. And allows my commitment to move me from being a consumer to a contributor. Uh, you know, we're just coming through Christmas and hopefully you received and hopefully you gave uh, gifts. Hopefully you were able to be here on Christmas Eve and bring uh, a, a birthday offering to the, uh, celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Uh, I hope that's true in your life. But I can tell you this in my life. I can tell you this in, my wife, in the life of Paulette. Uh, we, we appreciated the gifts that uh, was given to us, but the greatest joy that we had was being a contributor to the lives of other people, uh, especially the twins who we love and more than our, our own lives. Uh, and that's what it is in the Christian faith. Our commitment to the church and being involved allows us not just to be a consumer and getting uh, but to be a contributor who gives. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Why? Well, why is it more blessed? How, why are you more happy? Because uh, it's giving of yourself that brings real joy in your life. Number three, to be all God wants me to be, I must be committed to a model of his life. It's interesting, the very term Christian, uh, when it was a religion, <laughs> easy for you to say, uh, in its origin, originally when it was given, it wasn't a word of uh, prestige. It was a word of put down. It was a, it was a shame. Uh, the people saw people who were living like Christ say, look at those little Christ. Committed to model his life. And next week we're going to start talking about as we minister to the Lord, I think no one ever did that more than Jesus. He gives us a model that we are to follow. I pray that God will help us grab a hold of that model and begin to follow it in our life. As we grow, God wants us to be conformed to His image. Romans 8, 29 helps us to understand that that's the ultimate purpose of God. It's for us to be like Christ. Well, if that, if it's so great to be a Christian. Why am I going through all the difficulties and hardship? Listen, uh, you can't be like Christ if you don't go through some of the things that Christ went through. That's part of God molding and shaping and making us. Let me ask you, has anyone ever accused you of being a Christian? Has anyone ever accused you of being like Christ? As we grow, conformed to His image. What does it mean to be conformed to His image? Well, it means that we begin to think like Christ thinks. We begin to care for the things that Christ cared about. We begin to feel about our Heavenly Father as He did. Uh, Jesus Christ said, Not my will, but thy will be done. He even taught us to pray it in the model prayer. Listen, my beliefs and behavior, my attitude and my actions are constantly uh, being more and more like Christ. That's what it means to... Uh, be committed to the model of Christ's life. Uh, I love that passage in Judges chapter 6, verse 34 out of the Amplified Bible. It says that God wore Gideon like a suit of clothes. That's my prayer every day. God, God, wear me like a suit of clothes, Lord. I, I don't want anyone to see Charlie Wilson. I, hey, I don't even want to be Charlie Wilson. I want to be like Christ. He's my hero. He, he changed my life. He, he not only died in my place that my 
sins be forgiven, but my record is sponged. I'm living in his righteousness. I'm no longer judged for Charlie. I'm standing in the righteousness of Christ. Oh, my friend, my hero, Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says this. Let us go on and become mature in our understanding as strong Christians ought to be. Mature in our understanding. Uh, being more like Christ. God, help me to be that way. Because the more we get God's Word into our heart, the more we're going to become like Christ. A wonderful passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, verse 18. Let me just uh, find that for you really quick. Here we go. Chapter 3, verse 18. It's speaking of the example of Moses when he had been with God and he came down off the Mount of God and the Shekinah glory had just, had just stuck with him. It, it just was on him. Uh, and he said, but we with all with unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image of glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, New Living Translation reads like this. So all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, the Lord who is, our, who is spirit, makes us more and more like him. We're being changed in his glorious image. You know what he's saying? The more I look like Christ, the more I, the, I gaze into the word of God, I begin to look like him. And, and we know couples that live together so long, they, they, start, they start talking like each other, thinking like each other. And that's how it is. Well, how do I, how do I gaze into Christ? Because obviously, uh, I can't see Christ literally on this earth. Well, uh, you do it by gazing into the Word of God. My friend, the more I'm in the Word of God, the more the Word of God uh, is in me and I'm in it, the more I start reflecting Jesus Christ in my life. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said it like this. Commit yourself to instruction. Attune your ear to hear words of knowledge. Now, I know the answer to this already. I'm going to ask you a little survey question here. How many of you believe all the answers to last questions are given to us over the television? How many of us believe that all the answers to last questions is in Facebook or on the Internet? Yeah, I, how many of you believe that the answer to all of life's questions, literally, can be found in the Word of God? It amazes me that I believe that. I have believed that literally the majority of my life. But for years, I watched more TV than I looked in the Word of God. It doesn't even make sense. I pray now, when I open the Word of God, God, don't just let me see what you say, but let me begin to think like you think. And you know what? God is doing that. We spend most of our time viewing things that have no answers for the questions of our life, ignoring the Bible that says it is very God's very Word to us. It's able to uh, change us, transform our life. The Bible says this, Paul encouraging young Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. They must be committed to the revealed truths of the Christian faith and must live with a clear conscience. And so uh, I pray always that, that uh, God will be at work in my life. But here's what I'm doing. I, I am beginning to pray Scripture more. The older I get, the more I understand the importance of praying Scripture. And just this morning in my life, I, I, I was uh, praying through my, my prayer uh, journal. And uh, I just had been reading in 1 Thessalonians 
that wonderful book that encourages the believer so much, especially in times like this. And in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, Paul begins to, to say that he's praying for the Christians. In verse 2 he said, I give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in my prayers, remembering without ceasing your work and faith, labor of love, patience and hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the sight of God our Father, knowing, beloved brethren, that you're elect of God. Uh, for the gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much assurance. That we know what kind of men you are among uh, you for, for the sake of God. And I just had that list of people I'm praying for. And I tell you, I just started praying over those uh, who are believers. And I, I just started thanking them. Uh, I'm making mention of your prayers. I remember uh, your work and labor of love and uh, your, your hope in the Word of God. I, I just thank you, God. I, I, I bless this man. I bless this woman who, who is directing their life. See, it's praying Scripture. God is helping me understand how he thinks. And so when I come to Galatians and I'm praying, reading through the book of Galatians, and I come to chapter 5, I, my prayer starts to begin to rise up and ascend to God. Oh, God. Holy Spirit of God, produce in my life today love. Produce in my life today the joy of Jesus. Produce in my life today the peace that, uh, is, that passes all understanding, that keeps my heart and mind. Oh, Lord, today I'm praying that I'll be long-suffering. I'm praying, God, that there'll be kindness uh, seen in my life today and goodness and faithfulness. And I pray, oh, God, today that I'd have self-control. Uh, you know I've got to drive uh, on the LBJ today, God. I pray you give me self-control. Listen, God answers. That's being, that's being committed to be in, molded in the image of Christ. To be all that God wants me to be, I must be a minister of His grace. God has given each of us some abilities, the Bible says. Be sure and use them. Turn a million dollars. No, wait, I misread that. It says, be sure and use them to help each other. Passing on to others God's many kinds of blessings. I, I'm, to be a, I'm, I'm to pass out blessings. That's what I, I do. I, I'm, uh, I'm called to that, the Bible says. Each of us is to have a ministry to believers that is unique to us. Based on what? Based on how that God made us, our shape. And again, uh, I borrowed from Rick Warren. Uh, and and that, uh, he defines it like this, our shape. Uh, our spiritual gift, our heart for certain areas of ministry, our abilities, our personality, our life's experience, all these things are, are, are help mold us into how that God can use us. We all don't do the same thing, don't have interest in all these same things. But you, you see, the, the, the Bible, the, God doesn't expect any of us to do everything, but God does call all of us to do something. And so we're, we're to be shaped. Uh, the Bible says this in, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Your attitude must be like my own, Jesus said. For I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve. Ministry is the act of giving yourself away with no uh, plan or proposition for your own personal reward. God ministers to us by anointing our lives. When I... When I minister to God, He pours right back. You know, I can't outgive God. And when I minister to God, I just evoke the blessing of God on my life to fill me with the Spirit of God and anoint me so that I, I can be more effective in my ministry. Our life is God's gift to us, but what we do with that life is our gift to Him. And I, I believe uh, on the authority of Scripture that uh, when uh, I stand before God ultimately... As a believer on the judgment seat of Christ, I know I'm going to heaven. It's the reward stand. The reward is based on, A, what did I do with, with His Son, Jesus Christ? And B, what did I do with this one and only life that God gave me? Listen to me. The happy Christian is the involved Christian. The happy Christian is the one that's ministering to others. And then finally, if I'm going to be all God wants me to be, I must be committed to be a messenger of His love. I try to talk about this every week. As Christians, as a church, we are to be on 
mission for him, a mission that's common to all of us. What is that, Pastor? Well, it's obviously the Great Commission to go out in the world and make disciples. That's what God has called us to do, to impact others. You can't make a disciple that you haven't won to Christ, so we have to be on mission to win people to Christ. And then may God give us the ability to disciple them. Paul giving instruction to the church in, in uh, the Corinthian church in his second letter. Chapter 5 says this, For God was in Christ, re- reconciling the world unto himself. This is the wonderful message that he has given us to tell others. We are Christ ambassadors. God is using us to speak to others. What, is, what are we saying to others? Hey, there is a God, and his name's Jesus Christ. The best news the world has ever heard is the good news, the gospel. The world is far more ready to hear the message of the gospel than most Christians are willing to tell. But we are to live our life to fulfill the great commission of God. And again, Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, remember uh, why he is writing, Peter said, why, why God is waiting, excuse me. He is giving us time to get his message of salvation out to this world. And as I said when I began, missions was not birthed in a church business meeting, but it was birthed out of a church prayer meeting. When the leaders were praying and fasting, God put it on their heart. This is my will. How do I minister to God? I I minister to God by obeying, by following his will. Now, why don't we make these commitments? Why don't, why don't I make them? Why did I, why did I wait in my life later to make some things I should have made earlier on? Well, uh, sometimes we think if I really make a commitment to Christ, I'm going to lose my freedom. And I know struggling as a young Christian in my teenage years, being influenced by the world and being influenced for my family and church family uh, to live for Christ and make Christ a priority in my life. Well, my friends, if I really make a commitment to Christ, am I going to lose all my freedom? Listen, I, I've never had more freedom than the freedom that I have in Christ Jesus. It's a powerful thing that God deals with us. Uh, I might have any fun. I mean, how, how, can a, how can a Christian have any fun? Well, you're going to find out in life that uh, you, you, when you're serving God and doing His will, it's without regrets and it's without sorrow. That's what the Bible says. Oh, how many of us, as I said last week, would like a mulligan in life? Well, the Bible says that in Christ we have a new start, a fresh start. And here's the good news. That God is a God of not just of second chances. God is a God of 20 second chance. He's a God of 100 and second chance. Some people say, well, if I really make that commitment to God, I, uh, Pastor, I'd, I'd make that. But I, I'm not sure that I'd be willing to. I'd be able to keep it. I'm just not sure. Well, I want to tell you, my friend. Paul said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him. See, it's not me committing, keeping the commitment. It's God knowing my heart. He's he's working in my life, helping me keep those commitments. As I said last week, Philippians 2.13, giving us both the desire and the will, uh, the, the, the desire and the power, to live for Him. God's not looking for perfection in your life, my friend. He's just looking for a heart that's committed to Him, that loves Him. It's not about our ability. It's just about our availability. In uh, Exodus chapter 35... It's a passage that I read almost every day of my life. Moses was called by God to lead out his people. I I feel a call to lead in his church. And Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people. But you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said... I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now Moses is saying to God, Now therefore I pray, 
If I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I might know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, this is God speaking to Moses. My presence will go with you and I'll give you rest. Then he said to Moses, uh, Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, then do not bring us out from here. Now, how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. I want to tell you, my friend, did you know that God knows you by name? Oh, hallelujah. God knows you by name. And we sang those songs today. We sang Show Me That Way. It's one of my favorite courses. Because it's my heart's cry every day. Oh, God, show me your way. I want to live fully committed to you. Because, God, I want to minister unto you. As we close today, as almost every week, I call your attention to that beautiful priestly blessing of Numbers chapter 6, where the priest of the Lord was commanded by Moses to remind the people every time they meet. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let me tell you something about that peace. There's no greater peace that you'll have in your life than when you're living your life to minister unto the Lord. Are you ministering to him? God bless you. Thank you for joining us online today. We are so glad that you were a part of the service. If you have any questions about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, about baptism, or how to join our family at Central Baptist Church, we would love to answer your questions. You can use Facebook Messenger to send us a message, or you can call or email the church. You will find our phone and email information on our website. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. And may God bless you and give you peace.